Man, if anything was annoying in the studio, that one thing. <laughs> Hot take. Hot take indeed. <laughs> I mean, and, and that's not even coming from like a greedy perspective. Like you have to protect your own time. <sighs> oh, indeed. I, I also need hydration from a not LTT store.com water bottle <laughs> yet. <laughs> I need that screwdriver. Dude, I commented on that last compression video saying that they need to send you a screwdriver. I saw that. <laughs> yeah. And I don't know why they haven't yet because obviously, you know, oh. if I if I say it, they should be doing it right away. <laughs> uh, hey, everybody. I'm Josh. You might recognize me from a few of the previous shows on the channel. Um, this is Jeremy. I don't know if you know him or not. You might recognize him. That's my face on the wall. <laughs> That's his face on that sign right there. It's glowing nice and bright. Uh, yeah, so I guess this is our first little session dipping our toes into this idea of maybe a podcast-oriented yeah. type of approach to things. Trying stuff out. Let us know what you think. Some things just don't work as like 10-minute videos. Well, if you've seen my videos, you know they probably go like 20, 30 <laughs> minutes long. But even then... There's some things that just need to be fleshed out a little bit more, and I don't know if this exists on this channel yet, Recording Studio Loser, if this is going to take on its own thing, but mm -hmm. we wanted to put it out there and see what you guys thought, so. And I'm honestly like a habitual consumer of long-form content. I am too. Yeah. Sometimes I'm just in a mood where if it isn't more than two hours, I don't want to watch it, which sounds crazy <laughs> in this day and age, but... <laughs> Like, uh, if you're a fan of LTT, uh, their WAN show, I got so stoked when they started going like four or five hours long. I don't hang around quite that long. Ah, then you're not a real one, man. No, I'm Come not on a real now. One. I'm very surface level with LTT. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't always have the time for, for podcasts and such like that, but, um, you know, if I'm if I've got the day off or I'm doing some chores or something, it's just so nice to feel like you're hanging out with the folks, you know? You know what? <laughs> always blew me away about LTT was that I don't own a Windows machine or any like DIY machine at all, but I will watch like the, their, their entire videos. Yeah. I've been Mac based for like 15 years at this point. And I know they have some Mac videos in right. the Mac address. Yeah. I'll, I'll watch all of their videos and I have no idea what they're talking about, but they're fascinating. I'll watch them all too, man. Like I don't need to know what router is better than another router. I just use my internet <laughs> provider router <laughs> but man i'm gonna watch that whole video and see what they have to say um but yeah so we both like long form content uh there's tons of stuff that jeremy covers that you know could be elaborated on and i was just kind of excited for an opportunity to talk more music because i love that stuff yeah. gear playing everything in between here scoot in a little bit more scoochy scooch because it's like you're just on the edge of being in there we go i'll tell you what i'm not on the edge of i'm not on the edge of 17 i'm way past <laughs> that mark <laughs> <laughs> that's, what you, that's what you have to look forward to just i'm okay I'm real gonna, real bad I'm jokes so jeremy what uh what have we been up to today why am i even here in the first place who knows <laughs> well why are any of us here <laughs> <laughs> i've been working on developing course material for a couple different things and i reached out to you specifically because you have a way of explaining especially like the musical breakdown of things in a really refreshing way and if i'm being totally honest i don't want to be the only voice that's on these other platforms um and you guys have heard me plug them a couple times uh worship stream audio and then recording studio academy both of which neither have content yet we are hard at work making that and today was a marathon yeah of we content. put a put a big dent into some of that some of that today there's actually been some videos where the video we did making a song in 15 minutes yeah some people were stoked about the charting process and some people kind of like pissed them off a little bit but either way it seemed like there was an interest in like how does this work how can i learn that and that's what we kind of tackled so it was music theory from a very 101 perspective all the way up to reading a chart and we actually pulled out a chart yeah yeah and we pulled out a real deal chart that's been used here in whisper studios and um even talked briefly about how you can make changes to those charts and in a little bit of the more i wouldn't say super advanced but a little bit more technical kind of look at how to use the number system and modify it some yeah 
and there there's so many different ways to approach it and i even my knowledge is like pretty basic i know enough to communicate with you guys as players but i know there's a lot of people who want to know how to do that just to make what they're doing more efficient uh and i mean coming from the studio side of it it's like if i can make more songs in a shorter amount of time or if i'm hiring a room full of players it's more cost beneficial for everybody to get through as many songs as possible in the most efficient way as possible yeah yeah and like charting makes that so much easier yeah man it's it's efficient and then from the player perspective um i want the kind of most transparent and easy to digest rendition of what the songwriter has in mind or what you might have in mind as like a producer or when you get together for your uh, like pre-production uh, meetings and stuff and make those charts um, and then you know uh, you've seen this in some of the videos especially that uh, song in 15 minutes video but mm -hmm. Um, the way we work here and is kind of my favorite approach, but everybody kind of has a voice to, Hey, maybe we do this chord in the bridge instead, or we make this change. And if you can translate that concisely into numbers or into a chart in some fashion, everybody knows what you're trying to say without be like, Hey, look at my hand. I'm doing this here. Can yeah. you do that there too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there does seem to be a pushback with that. But even when you bring something like that up, like people don't want to learn anything theory related because you don't want to be put into a box. Like some of the comments on some of those videos are, man, we would just get in there and feel it. Like, of course, like mm -hmm. feel is such a massive part of this, but it's like getting uh, like a very vague recipe to make cookies. Like That's it. you could put more chocolate chips in there if you want to. And you know, I will. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You wanna you wanna add a little bit more flour? I don't know how to make cookies, so this is a bad <laughs> this is a really bad example. <laughs> but you'd find you wanna double the recipe. vanilla? You could double the vanilla. Like it's up for interpretation, is yeah. what I'm saying. Like if anything, the little bit that I have learned of music theory, and I'm no master at this at all, but it's kind of freed me up because you can think in patterns and mechanisms and harken back to like things that you like on the radio, and then when you right. break that down, you're like that's the reason I like that was that chordal rub or that particular suspension. And then you know how to recreate it in any aspect. Yeah. So I, I like the direction you're going with it here. So um, for those of you that, that don't know, or um, you know, haven't seen the the course video yet, cause it's far from being released yet. Right. Yeah. We got some <laughs> work to do right now yeah. as of this second. Um, I, I make a living uh, teaching some students theory, everything from the intro basic level stuff to more advanced like jazz theory and things like that. And um, regardless of what you do or don't know, um, it's, it's never a set in stone, you have to do this unless you're, you know, in an orchestral environment reading sheet music where you have a very specific puzzle piece that you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But um, to, to go back to the charts, like I understand that perspective wholeheartedly because I come from an improvisational background. Jazz was my main cup of tea and what kind of pulled me into music. Therefore, I love making choices in the moment of how do I want this to feel? How, mm -hmm. how do I want to change my approach to convey a different message? But when you're reading from a chart, it is, like you said, the most bare bones, like just roadmap to here's how we can all stay together. And I even covered this uh, towards the end of the, the course video of, okay, this is a one chord, but you can flavor that however you want. You can spice it up with extensions. You can, mm -hmm. um, even in the more advanced stuff, you can do a substitution. If you're a guitar player or a piano player in higher register, you can totally you know, not only invert the chord, but change the voicing all together and it will just add spice and sauce to it. So it's not a hard set in stone. Like you're just playing simple ideas and therefore you have no creativity. So mm -hmm. it's, it's tough to swallow that kind of perspective of, yeah, I don't want to learn that because it's going to trap me in a box. Whereas I look at it as, yeah, I want to learn that because I want more tools at my disposal. Like you can go avant-garde and pick random frets and turn it into music if you want to, even if you know all the rules. Yeah. Well, if nothing else, learning that piece of it, the theory side of it, again, identifying patterns. And then if you don't want to be stuck in a box, you can avoid the commonalities that are across all music. Like if a, if a one, four, six, five is boring to you, then you can completely avoid it or revoice it in different ways to make it kind of original. And if you don't know what that means, maybe you need to learn some music theory. <laughs> maybe you need to check out the course. Shameless plug. Shameless there plug. you go. But uh, 
it just goes back to like, how do you know your opinions unless you kind of venture into that? It, I know this is going way off topic, but it reminds me of... What is the topic? There is no topic. Okay, okay, <laughs> then this fair, fair game. So it goes back to some instances I have with players or... There's a lot of times you'll get when a band comes in. Maybe not session players, because session players are paid to kind of make you happy. So yeah. they'll do whatever with their tone. But when you bring a band in, sometimes you get pushback on different techniques that you'll want to use in the studio. And it inevitably comes back to, well, that's just my tone. Man, if anything was annoying in the studio, that one thing <laughs> like will get me going or shut me down in, yeah. in a session. Because like, how do you know? You don't even know. You don't know the mic I'm putting on there. Right. You don't know the pre you're going through. You've probably never been through this recording chain, let alone been in this room, which affects the tone of your instrument. So, well, and, and I think that is uh, an aspect coming again from the player perspective. You know, I don't run a studio. I understand how to run a DAW at the most basic settings and how to record a few tracks. But there's a there's a gap in my understanding from all the hardware, the different mic setups, and all these tips and tricks that you can do as an engineer or producer, right? So from that player perspective, there is so much you don't know that just like you said, if you don't know, how can you have an opinion on it? And I bet you have so many examples of, of people coming in and they might have a, okay, guitar is a perfect example for this, right? You have your amp, you're in a bedroom, you practice all the time, you have that tone dialed in. Maybe you have a $6,000 clone at your disposal and you love the way that boosts just a little bit. Sounds perfect in the bedroom. You come to the studio, you have all of your settings taped off, the dials exactly how they were in your bedroom. And then you're sitting in the control room after your first take and Either as a player, you're like, this sounds not like what I'm used to. Or as the engineer, you're like, hey, we need to make changes to your tone. You don't know that that's going to happen until you're in that experience. And so you have to go into all those experiences with this kind of learning attitude of, you know, checking that ego out the door and be like, okay, I know how to get a good tone I like in my bedroom. This is a new environment, a new experience, mm -hmm. and I need to be mixed in with the band. And that's a whole other aspect of being a player that... You know, a lot of people, I think, don't have an opportunity to tap into. That's a good point. Maybe I'm, I'm jumping to King. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I wasn't even. I'm, I'm more so on your side of, of there are just there are so many things that as a player you get dug into your ways. I mean, OK, personal example, right? I have touted for a very long time as a, uh, a primarily a bass player that I don't like Fender. Now, hot take. Hot take indeed. <laughs> um but I have learned over the years and I have kind of grown from that perspective of, no, I just don't like the sound of a generic, you know, J bass or P bass by itself in my bedroom. But as soon as you get that and you start putting into a mix, all of a sudden it's like this holy sound. It works great. It supports a lot of things. And that's part of that learning experience of, okay, I didn't like this because of the context that I was in. And after I experienced it in a different context, you know, I did a session, um, I did a session downtown a few years ago and they specifically wanted to use the rig that they had there with their base gear. Mm -hmm. And I was a hired gun. And like you said, I was there to make people happy and get the job done. Mm -hmm. And then I heard the tones. It was that classic pairing of a P bass into an SVT, mic'd up, no DI. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my. That's it. This is why people think it's so great. Yeah. Because it is. It's great. Yeah. I've been, I've, I've kind of been on that same train of like not wanting a P bass. And I think part of it is like my natural tendency to go against the grain with certain things. Like I will buy, I won't get certain plugins because a lot of people have that plugin. Yeah. Oh, listen, you use, you use a uh, Pro Q, right? Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Isn't that the most widely used one? <laughs> I did no. it before it was cool. <laughs> before, I made it cool. <laughs> there, no, but the having, I got a J bass because I didn't want a P bass. And at the time it was a stupid reason because I didn't even know the difference. Mm -hmm. I just knew everybody and their brother had a P bass. So I wanted to try something different. And now I go back. I'm like, I really want a P bass <laughs> for the studio with flats through yeah. a B15. Like, yeah, it, yep. <laughs> like, it's it's just... a magic sound, man. And as, as an engineer and, and you know, while you're mixing and trying to get the sound right, it fills the gaps in such a, I don't want to say unique way because there have been, there's, you don't have to get a Fender P bass and you don't have to play oh, yeah. through that SVT and like plenty of other axes will do that job. Right. But yeah. it's, it's the, uh, just the idea of you have that pickup set up in this combination of flat wounds and miking the cab 
Well, and I think part of it is like the fundamental of that instrument and like where it resonates is right in between typically where a kick and a snare are. Right. So if your kick is normally around 60 and the snare is 120, like a P bass just loves to hang around 80 hertz yeah. for some reason. And there's not much you have to do with it. You can get that vibe from other bases, especially with like stuff in post. But in the context of a session or in context of live, when all of it's happening and you don't have to do anything or you can't do anything to it, that thing just lives there. Man, let's talk about this idea real quick about, cause you, you brought up, you can get that kind of sound in post, but with that kind of combo of, of bass and mic in the cab and stuff specifically, it's just kind of there out of the box. Right. Um, I, as a player, have plenty of, example of examples of how kind of creativity and productivity can be spurred from not having to be finicky with the tone. But like, what's what's your perspective of that as like, you're the one in the control room messing with the knobs, fiddling with the mic placement. How much of this is, in your mind, you're thinking ahead of like, how can I make this sound in post? What can I do to this versus um, being inspired by the tones in the moment without having to fiddle with it much. I always lean towards the latter for sure. Mm. And it's, I think it's more about, and it's different for every session and there's a lot of different contexts. And if you trust the players in the room, then it's definitely, then it's definitely more trying to do whatever I'm doing to get out of the way and minimize distractions and make sure like a lot of that work is done front, like even down to like the stupid little things, like getting lines run before anybody walks in the door right. so that if something does happen, I know it's not the lines, like the right. hardest thing to troubleshoot in the moment, or even like laying the cable in a certain way that when a, when an amp is going in the amp room or the bass cab's rattling, like nothing's going to buzz. Like just those l tiny little things are what make the massive differences because you could have the most killer chain like i could run your bass through you know a neve preamp and then a stupid expensive compressor going through crazy expensive converters but if that cable shorting out none of it matters <laughs> none of it matters like, or if you have a ground loop yeah. and a pedal board or something like that yeah all that stuff is useless so it's more about minimizing those distractions and getting things out of the way and then i will lean on what are the players doing what can i accentuate what are the differences that they're naturally doing because good players will play off of each other in so many unique ways yeah and i like keep looking over towards the room because i'm like a picturing when you guys are doing it yeah and like even the the subconscious level stuff is a huge part in like, what what am i doing in the room to get them out of their head mm -hmm. you know but if it's a if it's a band there definitely are those thoughts of then you, you need to start making decisions like okay what's going to be the lowest instrument here the kick drum or the bass or mm -hmm. and that could be how good is the bass player right can yeah. he hang down there by himself so it's just a different situation yeah totally and a lot of those things that you touched on like the the small differences making the biggest quality of life improvements from a player perspective that's why i have always appreciated about um just working with you in general, especially here at the studio, is when I'm driving up here for a session, I know we are going to be cozy. It's always a good vibe here, <laughs> regardless of the iterations. If you f follow the channel for a while, you've seen a few different iterations yeah. of the studio, right? Um, and I know that everyone you hire all the time is a good hang, which if you are either a musician or prospective session player, engineer, studio owner in any kind of music business, you've got to understand early that the hang factor is arguably more important than how good you are For at sure. your specific job. For sure. You could be the most, most virtuosic person. And if you are not a fun person to be around or not an encouraging, inspiring person, I'm not going to want to work with you. I'll work with somebody that has half the skill and, you know, laughs and makes some jokes and has some good input on whatever's mm -hmm. going on. That's aside the point. What I was uh, really meaning to say is, is as a player coming in the studio, knowing that you've done those things like running all the lines, checking them, making sure everything's working right, making sure that, you know, not only do I have uh, the avioms and headphones at my station, but there's also like an extra adapter of mine's buzzing, which I think happened the last time I was in here. It was a while ago, but I think I had to swap out an adapter and you just had, you like, yeah, 
here's here's another one but having all those small things covered makes me comfortable and also puts me in a position as a player of if anything goes wrong sonically or or gear wise it's going to be my stuff so i also have this heightened responsibility of making sure like Hmm. all of my stuff is prepared well to come in because there's no fallback you know if i decided to be (laughs) like in a bad mood or have a poor personality and blame bad tone on you i can't do it there's nothing that you're doing that is faulting my signal chain. That's an interesting point I've never thought about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That kind of leads me to a question um, I, I soft pitched to you earlier before we started all this. And you've had some time to think. But um, with all of those quality of life things that you do now, I'm assuming that some of those were born out of maybe mistakes or kind of thinking back to situations and changing your approach to things. So do you have any like early memories of learning experiences i'll call them not failures or mistakes but oh, things man. you learn from at, either as a engineer or uh, uh on the business side of running the studio what are what are some things early on that really help shape your your path and understanding of the industry now uh business side i learned real quick to get the money early because <laughs> <laughs> i mean i mean and that's not even coming from like a greedy perspective like you have to protect your own time whether you're a studio or a player Mm -hmm. or anybody anywhere in life you have to protect your own time and our only real way to do that as a studio owner is to get a deposit yeah make them buy into the process even if they want to get on the calendar because i can't without fail even when i do like favors for people who are friends and i don't take a deposit they cancel and then i have one day if i'm lucky if it was a really short session most often it's like two or three days that are just wasted and there's yeah. nothing there now i can make a youtube video and it's not the end of the world yeah, you but have busy work not busy work but you have ways to fill that time yeah. if it happens but back when i was getting my start that was like i mean that would affect my month mm-hmm. like because that was my bottom line just disappearing yeah and so it was really quick after that that I started chart forcing people to at least put twenty five percent down. Yeah, and that comes off your total. All you gotta do is show up. Yeah, like, <laughs> and if you don't show up, that money's mine because at least I know I'm making something for the day that was that I can't rebook. And part of it comes down to customer service and like, yeah, if somebody has an emergency, you work around it. Like, there's yeah. certain things that you just can't avoid. Family emergencies, medical stuff, and like, it's happened to me and I've had to cancel. So I expect people to kind of give me that same leniency. So there's a whole human aspect of it. But going back to that thought of like protecting your own time. And I think when you set that precedent early with people they just they just accept it yeah whereas if if it's like a conversation you're having and you're maybe talking to a prospect and you get way deep in the conversation what do you want all this and then you start talking money and then it's like oh i need money right now yeah then it gets a little weird and a little shady but if that's up front and that's like that's why i have all that stuff on my website too so it's like you know what you're getting into yeah like i'm not trying to hide anything from you this is all transparent but this is how it's going to be and it's like okay man those are the hard conversations just anything financially related like as somebody that's creative or as an artist in any medium when money enters the picture things feel weird especially Mm -hmm. in the music industry a lot of the work especially early on is amongst the people that you know well and and call friends and stuff right but um i i see that all the time where you know um thankfully i haven't been burned financially by somebody um and i'm i'm really appreciative of that it just means i've not had the opportunity to come across a sour person you Mm -hmm. know um but I know I've heard so many horror stories of uh, doing the gig, not getting paid oh, yeah. or um, anything and everything in between. So um, what's what's your take on, let's say, you know, whoever's watching this now, maybe you're a beat maker, maybe you don't own a studio, but you have some, you, you know, your way around a DAW and you have some pretty all right uh, studio monitors and, you know, a friend has a band that wants to get their stuff mixed or whatever. How early it, like, is there a too early to have that financial conversation in your business? Like, if this is your, you know, first time you're getting paid for something or expecting to be mm. paid, do you think you bring that up immediately and say, hey, I am planning on making a career out of this. I would like to get paid. I know I'm starting out. 
I'm trying to make my rate uh, adjusted for that. This is a learning experience for all of us, but here's what I expect and here's when I expect it. Do you think there's a too early for that conversation to happen? I don't know. I mean, if you're making that transition into that, like, because it seems like doing stuff for free into being paid and we all tread that line right? Uh, at some point in our careers and it is always awkward. <laughs> it is a very awkward I, time. The way I did it, like, mm, it wasn't necessarily like somebody coming back and it's like, oh, by the way, now I charge. Thankfully for me, it was like a totally different. So I set that precedent with that person and then it was just accepted. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you need to have that conversation with somebody, and I, and I know engineers who have worked just like this with friends, and it's like, you know what, this is now becoming kind of a job. And some of those conversations went really well, and some of them went really, really bad. Yeah, some people do not receive that well. No, <laughs> but it's, I think, I think it's respecting yourself if you know, like, hey, I am trying to do a good job with this. And with that comes time. And with that, I got it pay my water bill you right, know like, right. and just have an open on an honest conversation because maybe if it's not that person you know maybe you go find somebody else to work with and then when you can afford to work with that other person for free then you come back yeah especially if it's like a project you just want to be a part of regardless of the financial side oh, of it for sure the passion projects are huge especially yeah. when you're getting your start and i mean even now i still don't tell everybody else but <laughs> it's, it's a secret it's a secret <laughs> <laughs> um yeah man uh so as far as this idea of long form content podcast vodcast i think that was a term for a hot second and i think it went away oh yeah um <laughs> i know that you and i don't have a super firm idea of exactly what that's going to look like um i know that we have some podcasts that we both thoroughly enjoy and and like to set our course in a similar direction and stuff. Are you listening? I hope you're listening. <laughs> if you've made it this far, then you're definitely listening. <laughs> Any ideas, please let us know. I think we're tossing around some ideas as well. This may exist on this channel for a little bit, but I think the hope is if you guys like it, and please let us know if you do, that this will kind of become its own thing yeah. and go on its own channel. So, And I think there's other ideas. And of course, if there's anything that, you know, you want to throw into the mix, pop it in the comments and let us know kind of what direction you want it to go. Um, should it be just Jeremy and I, or should there be a guest every once in a while? Do you want to see more gear related kind of conversations, experience oh. conversations? Um, I had a few ideas of maybe we rate some studio setups or maybe even live gigging setups. Um, or maybe even, you know, we kind of find a way to have user submitted mixes that you can listen through and provide some feedback at some point. That would be super interesting. I think that would be fun. And getting the community involved, uh, maybe, you know, pepping up some Discord, getting all you guys to, to join there to, you know, make friends in the comments and that kind of stuff. Which there is a Recording Studio Loser Discord that is highly inactive right now. And hopefully, I think Josh is going to help me figure out how to navigate that world. Because I'll be honest, I use Discord for one thing, and that's mid-journey. Yeah, well, hey, that is one of the most important things on Discord, let's be honest. <laughs> yeah, we'll uh, spruce up some of that stuff and kind of kind of see what direction you guys want to go. And um, for me, I think this is just a, really just another excuse to hang out with you, if I'm being honest. But also... I'm okay with it. <laughs> uh, just kind of a fun, music-oriented... Uh, just Let's just talk about some stuff. Whatever, whatever goes, goes. I'm down. Yeah. If you're down, let us know. Let us know. Uh, to show us that you're down, maybe like leave a bread emoji in the in the comments. There's a bread emoji? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is device dependent. Device dependent. <laughs> maybe, maybe uh what's a what's a good unique emoji? Um oh, no, maybe curious. like a, a sailboat or Ooh, that's a good one. But here's the problem, Jeremy. I, I can't swim like that's, at all. You got a boat. You're oh, gonna that's be true. fine. I never thought I'd be on a boat. Um, How about a goat? A goat? I there's like a, a goat. There's a goat. What about a little ghost? The little ghosty ghost? Ghost goat. Ghost goat. There you go. Leave a ghost goat. Leave a ghost goat in the comments to show that you're really with us uh, because, you know, we know you already hit subscribe. We know you already hit like. We know that you already have that bell notification ticked. So leave, uh, leave us Clearly. a ghost goat. Ghost goat. And if you left bread, we know you didn't make it all the way to the end, so sorry. But thanks for trying. Just try again next time. <laughs>
Oh, I need to do the sign off real quick. If you did like it, obviously hit the like button, subscribe for more. Let me know if we want to do more stuff with Josh in the future. And we'll catch you guys in the next one. Later. Peace.